Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for joining this talk uh, hosted by the Sussex Ornithological Society. I'm Mark Malaview, and this evening's talk is by Steve Edgerton Reed, who has the uh, great good fortune to run the White Tailed Eagle Reintroduction Programme on the Isle of Wight. I say good fortune, but I know it's an extremely busy and demanding job, and uh, he, he may have moments when he regrets it, but I'm sure it's uh, an extremely rewarding uh, and, in, and enjoyable job. And I've very much enjoyed, as, as the former recorder for Sussex, the really fantastic um, communications that, that's existed between us uh, and the project, which has been very, very valuable in terms of the society understanding uh, the movements of eagles uh, within Sussex. Um, one thing I'd like to uh, say before we before I hand over to Steve is that you can ask questions, uh, which is easy to do. You just um, press on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. And uh, we have Martin Orchard Webb, who's the assistant recorder for the Sussex Ornithological Society, who will uh, do his best to get through all your questions uh, at the end of the talk. So he'll, he'll um, ask he'll pose them and ask uh, Steve to answer them. So I think we're pretty much good to go now. So I'm going to pass over to uh, Steve to start his talk. Uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you, Mark. So I'll just um, share my screen if I can. It might take a second to load up. Um, hopefully, Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so yeah, thank you, Mark, for the introduction and, uh, and thank you all for, for coming. It's an amazing turnout, 291 people at the moment I can see. That's um, absolutely fantastic. And I, I hope you all enjoy, enjoy this evening's talk. So, um, so I, I work for Forestry England. Um, so the White-Tailed Eagle Reintroduction Project here on the south coast of England is uh, partnership led by the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation and Forestry England. And it's a, it's a five year um, translocation programme started in 2019, as I'm sure many of you are well aware. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of the very basics. I uh, appreciate this is a ornithological group, so um, no doubt you all know what a white-tailed eagle is, but um, very briefly, just to make sure you know. Uh, this is a white-tailed eagle, this is what they look like at, um, as adults. So um, they take about four to five years to reach uh, lower adult plumage, maybe a bit longer in some cases. It's widely regarded as uh, the fourth largest eagle in the world by wingspan and, and by weight. Um, generally, it's associated with wetland uh, environments, but these birds are, are pretty generalist and, uh, and are remarkably adaptable, as, um, as you will see. I'm just going to start my stopwatch, make sure I don't overrun too much for you guys, your guys' sake. Um, and uh, I'm sure many of you have heard the term flying barn door. Uh, and as you can see, you know, this, this enormous wingspan at two and a half meters is really quite something. And those of you that have seen these birds will no doubt um, have pretty um, you know, well, well, uh, well impressed memories of how big these birds are. But I think one of the other things that's really notable about this bird to me is when I see it is, is they, they kind of look like they've gone to the hairdressers with these, these pale heads. They've got these highlights in there. In their feathers and uh, this magnificent yellow bill, bright yellow eye, which uh, its Gaelic name in Scotland is um, the bird. Of, I, I can't I can't pronounce it. I'm not going to try, but uh, but it is the bird with the sunlit eye is what it's known as. And uh, and of course, once they're adults, they have these magnificent white tails, which uh, kind of gives the name away, I guess, at white-tailed eagle. But in the four to five years before they reach that point, they're generally pretty brown all over. So they're kind of a bit dull looking and the birds that we release initially, they, they look very much like this. And uh, as I already mentioned, their, their plumage takes four to five years um, and a few cases a little lo longer to, to reach that magnificent adult plumage. So it's a really widespread bird, this bird. Um, and if I get the laser pointer out again, I'll just be able to annotate this a little more. So you see, you know, there's a population as, as far west as Greenland to us and in Iceland, population in Scotland that's well known, reintroduced population there, uh, population in, in Scandinavia and all the way through Asia. Um, this, this bird um, breeds in, in 
Siberia and in, uh, in much of Russia, but also winters in places like Japan and the Himalayas and, and the Middle East. But you'll notice on this map, there's this big gap here in Western Europe. And we're going to go into that in a little more detail. But this isn't this gap isn't there because this bird has never been there. It's because this bird was exterminated from that part of its range. And this, this bird was um, highlighted in the, in the UK government uh, conservation, or oh, I'm sorry, environment plan, a 25 year environment plan as being explicitly mentioned as a species of importance for reintroduction here in England. Um, and to add to that, there are other reintroduction efforts ongoing in, uh, in Western Europe. There's a project that's um, just started in Spain uh, and there's talks of projects in, uh, in France as well, or in, in Northern France. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a species that is rapidly uh, recovering its range. Um, what does this bird actually do? Why is it why is it important in the landscape? Why is it um, you know why is it important that we reintroduce this bird into the ecosystem? So this bird is very much a generalist predator, but it is an apex predator. It's very top of the food chain. There's nothing that predates white-tailed eagles once they reach adulthood. And um, you know this bird very much performs roles that other birds cannot do in the landscape. So it's uh, you know, its preferred prey is fish, um, and there are fish species that this bird takes that not a lot of other birds will take. So birds like osprey will take things like pike as well, but pike don't have a lot of natural predators, and this bird is a very important predator of pike across, across its range in Europe. But other species that this bird will eat, things like Canada geese and grey lag geese, you know, there's lots of feral geese here in the UK, and across Europe, and this bird is an important predator of those species too. And uh, and you look particularly in the nearby Netherlands, and I'll talk about the Netherlands in a little more detail. Uh, but in the nearby Netherlands, grey lag and uh, Canada goose goslings make up a big part of this bird's diet um, in the summer months. Um, but when fish isn't available, water birds and uh, you know particularly um, things like geese, gulls, and, and ducks are really important. Um, really valuable in, uh, in their diet throughout the year, but particularly through late summer and into the autumn. And then other things like rabbits and hares also constitute important parts of these birds' diet. And, uh, and we're seeing that across England in particular, that rabbits are really important in these birds' first years. Um, but particularly for juvenile birds, um, in their first winter, carrion is a key part of the diet and without carrion a lot of these birds struggle through the winter, winter months um, but if you're a white-tailed eagle and you're bigger than everyone else you don't need to uh, to catch your own food you don't need to go and find carrion you can steal it from others and these birds are fantastic pirates they're really really good at stealing meals not only from things like gulls but also from um, mammals like otters and uh, and I've even seen these birds uh, pirate from um, peregrine falcons and even one bird that I'll talk about uh, in greater detail later on even attempted to steal a, a blackbird from a, from a sparrowhawk. So they are incredible pirates, they're just schoolyard bullies really, and uh, they're incredibly lazy birds, spend about 90% of the day sat in a tree doing nothing, just watching the world go by and, uh, and waiting for the opportunity to feed. But just as their diet and their, uh, you know, um, and, and how they behave is very generalist, um, their nesting behavior is very generous too. Um, so I'm just going to get the laser pointer again. Um, and this, this uh, tree nest here, so trees generally are where these, these birds nest, but they're happy to nest on cliff faces, on rock faces across this bird's range. And even in, um, in parts of Finland, this bird will nest on the ground too. So there's island archipelagos in Finland that they'll nest on. So it's, it's really not particularly picky and you look at the tree species on the on the left hand side of the text there and you can see there's a whole range of tree species that this bird uses and typically they'll use same nest sites year after year they might within their territory they might have two or three nest sites but they'll keep returning to those nests and, and generally speaking they have a preferred nest site too but if you look at this image at the top here you can see this is a white-tailed eagle nest that's been built on year after year after year and they can get so big these nests that they'll actually collapse branches or stems of trees that they are uh, you know the sheer weight of the nest will do that uh, so they're, they're quite incredible structures but you can see very top here 
I'm just trying to circle for you, is a white-tailed eagle. So what an enormous nest that is. Um, uh, quite something. And uh, having seen a few white-tailed eagle nests in Scotland, they are really, really impressive structures. And, uh, and through the, the breeding season, which runs sort of March through to, um, to July, August, um, these birds will raise one to two young, typically. Um, but of course, a lot of younger pairs will, will fail altogether. Um, and, you know, these, these birds, people will talk about them. And I've, I've had conversations with people that suggest that these birds are birds of remote areas and, uh, you know, rural Scotland is a fantastic place for them. Don't get me wrong. Um, but they will readily breed near human habitation. And, uh, and there's a couple slides later that you'll see, um, hopefully agree that these birds can live in a uh, in busy place like Southern England. And if you're not convinced, I suggest a, a city break to Helsinki in the summer, where there is a white-tailed eagle pair right on the edge of the city centre. Really quite, uh, I, I've not been, I quite like to go to Helsinki myself, um, but if you get a chance, go and see the white-tailed eagles in Finland. So that's a very brief um, biology and ecology of this bird. Um, appreciate a lot of you would have already um, understood that, um, and but it's really important to get the background uh, in place. So I'm going to very briefly, again, talk about the history of white-tailed eagles in the British Isles. And again, this might be uh, something a lot of you are familiar with. And if you want to learn more about this, there's loads of great resources online and, um, and uh, plenty of books that cover particularly the um, history of reintroduction in Scotland. So as many of you will be well aware, white-tailed eagles, like many birds of prey, were relentlessly persecuted throughout the British Isles from the Middle Ages onwards, having been revered in the past. And uh, you know, white-tailed eagles were you know, considered um, you know, almost godlike in, uh, in um, prehistoric Britain. And uh, there's plenty of examples around the world of, of people um, having sky burials and uh, being quite quite an honour to be eaten by a, a carrion eating bird uh, taken into the heavens so to speak um, but unfortunately this this attitude changes through the middle ages um, and gradually slowly but surely this bird gets pushed further and further to the edge of its range and, uh, and the last pairs in England would have been in the least accessible places that they could find and here in southern England uh, anecdotally we know you have a last pair bred here on the Isle of Wight on a place uh, called Culver Cliff. Um, and you can go to Culver Cliff now and you might be lucky enough to see a white-tailed eagle um, hunting off the coast of Culver down and, uh, and in Sandown Bay for bass and mackerel that, um, that shoal there um, in the autumn and, and summer months. Um, but this last, last pair existed in southern England in 1780, some 240 years ago, and gradually, surely, um, slowly but surely, this bird's pushed out of England. The Isle of Man, the last pair bred in 1815. And uh, in Scotland, the last bird was shot in the early 20th century. So um, as this bird became rarer and rarer, it became more and more impressive to have uh, be the last person to have shot a white-tailed eagle. It's a, it's a really sorry story, a really sad, tragic story that um, many other birds of prey suffered. However, you know, this is all very well and good, these anecdotes, but how do we know this bird? was ever widespread in England. Well, if you look at this map, I'll get my laser pointer out again. I've got two maps here. We've got a map on the left, map A, which shows all these black dots are places or places that um, have names indicating that white-tailed eagles were present or white-tailed eagle nest sites or eyries were present. So you can see from that map, there's a lot of places. None of these places are called Eagle Town or Eagleville. These are all based off the old English name um, for eagle being urn. So I don't know where this place in Sussex is, uh, um, might, would sound urn-like. Um, I'm sure some of you guys will know. Um, my uh, geography of Sussex isn't amazing, but the nearest place that I know of um, is in Dorset, a place called Arn, somewhere I used to live actually. So, um, so and then there's places like urn, Urnley and all, all kinds of um, place names with suggestion that white-tailed eagles were present and uh, rather interestingly from an Isle of Wight perspective there was a place called um well, there's two rivers called Yar on the Isle of Wight and it's not because people on the Isle of Wight didn't speak to each other on one side to the other there's a west Yar and an east Yar it's not it's not like that Dr Seuss uh, novel um or story 
the, the Zacks, the south going and north going Zacks or west and east going Zacks. It's not like that. I think um, I was speaking to a local historian here. Um, a lot of rivers were named after places, not the other way around, supposedly. Um, and some of you might be better versed in this than I am. Um, but there used to be a town called Yarborough in the east of the white, which isn't far from Culver Cliff. Uh, and he believes that actually the term Yar is another term to describe an eagle area or a place where eagles are. So um, it's almost, it is almost called Eagle Town. Um, but anyway, I digress. If we look at map B, map B shows indication of all the places uh, where archaeological evidence have been found for white-tailed eagles. So fossil remains um, from the Pleistocene all the way up to medieval period. So again, you can see that generally speaking through England, this bird is pretty widespread. Not as many uh, indications as in um, on the uh, in place names, but certainly plenty of evidence to suggest this bird was pretty widespread throughout the UK. Get rid of my laser pointer. But the story gets more positive from here. Um, so many of you will, um, and I think this timeline is quite useful, um, and for those of you that are already familiar with the story, it'll be a nice little refresher for you all. But the first sort of pioneering efforts to reintroduce white-tailed eagles in, in Scotland started in 1968. Um, so a young Roy Dennis, who the Roy Dennis Foundation is, uh, is named after, um, was the first person looking after these birds in, the, in my capacity, I suppose, um, in 1968, some time ago now. And they released four white-tailed eagles on, on Fair Isle um, off the Scottish coast. Um, and all those birds within a year and a half disappeared. It's considered a utter, utter you know, waste of time, utter failure. But those first pioneering efforts were really important in uh, developing understanding of how the process works. Uh, you, don't, you don't succeed without failing first, do you? So um, it took a little while and now another seven, eight years for people to be brave enough to have another go. And in 1975, um, a much larger scale project started on the Isle of Rum um, and 92 birds were released over that 10 year period. Um, and by 1985 had a first successful breeding, although that wasn't on Rum, that was on Mull, not too far away, but on Mull. Um, so first successful fledgling there. Um, but you know, progress was really slow at this point. Uh, and even in the early 90s, there weren't very many pairs of white-tailed eagle in Scotland. So it was thought necessary to um, undertake a further release in the Westeros. And they released another 56 birds, taking on board lessons they'd learned from the previous two reintroduction efforts and, and efforts elsewhere in the world. And by 1995, you got first wild fledged young from, from wild stock. Um, and then by 2000, you've got over 100 fledged young, a real success story in Western Scotland. Fantastic news and, um, and you know, I, 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 and I'm sure I, I grew up in this time where there are lots of um, bad news stories for conservation, but this is a good news story for conservation. So um, really pleasing to see. But the story doesn't end there. You know, this bird, although well established in Western Scotland, doesn't spread very far. And um, we'll talk about that in more detail shortly. Um, but in 2000, between 2007 and 2012, there were two other projects that set up. One in, uh, in Fife in Eastern Scotland, released 85 juvenile white-tailed eagles there. And another in Southwest Ireland um, in Killarney National Park, where 100 white-tailed eagles were released over that five, same five-year period. And by 2013, both projects see their first pairs successfully breed. A remarkable success. Um, Fast forward now beyond 2018, as this slide says, actually 2021, there's more than 150 pairs in, uh, in Scotland in total. So fantastic news for this bird that was only, you know, a few years earlier, pretty much extinct. Um, but the Irish Reintroduction Project is a, is a really good example for us in Southern England of how we want to see things progress. Um, so if you look at this table, this table always looks, every time I do this talk, this table looks more complicated um, than, I, than I want it to look. But the premise is um, actually quite simple. You look, so the first pair formed in 2010, only three years after the first release. And then by 2012, you have an 
active nest from one of these pairs, 2013, year after the last release, you have successful breeding. And you fast forward to 2017, you can see there's 10 active pairs and overall there's been 21 fledged young. Unfortunately for the Irish project, they've had a few setbacks. One of those setbacks is um, um, that uh, these birds, have, um, a couple of their best pairs have suffered from bird flu. Um, so they've actually done a reinforcement program in the last few years. So I think they've released 30 birds in the last two years, actually. So um, and the latest release, same time as ours this summer. So, um, so that project is still very much in its infancy and it shows that, you know, things can really, even after that initial success, things can still go wrong. But sort of looking at the bigger picture in terms of stakeholder engagement and, uh, um, and public uh, impression of a project, I think uh, there's some really important parallels for us going forward. Um, if you look at the, I'm sure many of you would have read the headlines in 2019 when we first uh, proposed the project, um, or first had the license to release these birds in England. Um, and there were lots of concerns from, particularly from the farming community, but also from others about um, conflict with livestock in particular, but conflict with small dogs and you name it, you, I'm sure you guys would have heard it. These same concerns were raised in Ireland. But you fast forward 10 years after those first concerns were raised and actually the um, farming community are very on board of a project and almost everyone views this project positively and those that don't at least view it in a neutral capacity. You know, they say, oh, well, you know, I'm not really that bothered by it, but um, my concerns haven't come into fruition. And all those concerns that were raised were the same concerns primarily around lambs. To date, there has still been no case of a live lamb being taken by white-tailed eagles in Ireland. So um, a lot of that is down to how well the project worked from the very outset with the farming community. And we're trying to emulate that, um, that process ourselves. You know, we, we take, um, we try and talk to all stakeholders, you know, yourselves being an important stakeholder of a birding community and uh, conservation community being really important stakeholders to try and get the messages out there and dispel these myths um, and, and try and allay some of the fears about these birds. And, and also actually just everyone can enjoy these birds. I've had farmers call me up uh, on the Isle of Wight uh, with concerns, um, you know, mostly just having seen a white-tailed eagle and never seen one before. And one farmer, I remember he said to me, he said, oh, you know, I, I'm a bit worried. I've seen this, this, this eagle uh, over, my, um, over my sheep. And I said, well, what's he doing? He said, well, he's just flying about and I'm quite enjoying watching him. I said, well, you, you're allowed to, you know, <laughs> you can enjoy seeing, seeing these birds flying around. And, uh, and, you know, we haven't seen any, any conflict here on the Isle of Wight or in the South, South of England either. So things are going really well from a stakeholder perspective um, and hopefully going forward. Um, that will remain to be the case, as is evidence from Ireland. That's enough about the history of white-tailed eagles in the UK. Why, you know, why are we reintroducing them to southern England? What, what is the purpose of this reintroduction? Well, um, I'll get my laser pointer out again. Oh, sorry. Press the wrong button. Uh, get my laser pointer out again. We already talked about these three populations that have been reintroduced to the British Isles. Excuse me one minute. <coughs> so you've got this western coast population, uh, Isle of Mull is highlighted here, and you've got the east coast population here in Fife, and then southwest island, Killarney National Park. And then you'll see there's no populations established in southern Scotland and England, in Wales, nothing in the north of France. Or the north coast of France. Actually, the nearest population to us is in the Netherlands. Um, and then there's a very small population um, on the French and German border, three pairs. Um, but these birds take an inordinate, inordinate amount of time to spread. So their breeding biology means they almost always go back to where they fledged, where they, that's where they perceive to be home. And they try and set up the territory as close as they can to that area. So they can find a vacant territory there, they will, but they can't find a vacant territory. These birds are territorial and you know they'll, 
they'll actually fight to the death for territory. The only thing that really controls white-tailed eagles is other white-tailed eagles. And they can have pretty large territories, you know, anything from 10 square kilometers upwards to 30 square kilometers. So they can, they can be pretty big, but these birds will compete for territory nearby if they can't find a vacant territory. And if that fails, they'll start to spread further afield. So the rate of spread of populations is incredibly slow. These long-lived birds live up to 25 years. Um, and if you know, they kill each other for territory or um, find vacant territories near home, they'll actually take decades and decades to spread from that natal area. Um, and a really good example of that is northeast France, where so the, the bird went extinct in France in the 1950s. The last pair was in um, actually in Corsica in the Mediterranean, so nowhere near um, the Laurent in um, northeast France there. Um, but from the 1960s onwards, they've had fairly regular sightings of white-tailed eagles in that part of France. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you will um, be familiar that actually we don't get very regular visitors from the continent here on the south coast of England still, you know, even, even where we get the occasional bird, we don't get lots and lots of continental white-tailed eagles here. But those 1960s birds, the first breeding didn't happen until 2011. So despite having regular visitors all that time, first breeding in France took all that time. So it will take decades for these birds to re-establish here on the south coast of England under their own steam. Um, and you know that some people might say, or, and some of you in the audience might say, well, that's acceptable. You know, we can wait that long. And I, you know, that's fair enough. And, um, but from my, my personal opinion is that it's our moral duty to restore this bird here in the UK throughout this whole form of range. We are the only reason this bird isn't here now. Our, our previous actions are the reason this bird has become extinct in this part of the world. But there's a really good slide later, um, so hold your anticipation for that. But we can establish a breeding population here on the south coast of England. We've got a really good chance of linking these other populations in the British Isles with those expanding populations in Western Europe. Um, and there's a really good slide that I hope you'll see, we'll demonstrate that quite well shortly. But why the Isle of Wight? Why not West Sussex or East Sussex? Well, the last known breeding site, anecdotally at least, in Southern England was here on the Isle of Wight. So that's, some people say that's good enough reason. Um, you know, it's also, if you haven't been to the Isle of Wight, do come to the Isle of Wight. It's a wonderful tourist um, destination, fantastic views, uh, good, view, uh, good views and good walks. And I think um, there's a vineyard that was ranked second best vineyard in, uh, in the UK recently. Um, fantastic uh, tourist attractions. I, I don't work for the tourist board, but I grew up here on the Isle of Wight and it's a wonderful place to, to come and visit. So please do visit if you can. But its location is really important. It's been important throughout history. Um, you know, the French and the Spanish always wanted to conquer the Isle of Wight and take it as a foothold to get themselves to Portsmouth and Southampton and, uh, and a foothold into England. Um, but white-tailed eagles don't care about that. It's just a really good place for them to naturally disperse both east and west. Got fantastic breeding and wintering habitat throughout the south coast of England. So Pool Harbour to the west, New Forest, Bashford Lakes, Chichester Harbour and Pagham and the Arran Valley um, in, Sussex, in Sussex, but also the Solent itself and the Isle of Wight itself as well. Um, add to that, there's a really dedicated conservation movement here in Southern England and, and you guys here tonight, all 324 of you now, are a real testament to that. You know, you're all really passionate about, um, about conservation here in England um, and that stands project really good stead to, uh, to see it go forward. Um, and then final piece is that it's really not too dissimilar to the nearby Netherlands where white-tailed eagles are simply thriving and we're going to talk about that now. So oh I've got my laser pointer on I don't know why. Try and get rid of that. So Tim and Roy from Roy Dennis Foundation actually visited the, uh, the Netherlands just before the start of the project where there are um, um, upwards of I think it's 20 to 30 breeding pairs now um, within the Netherlands. And it provides a really good example of how these birds can thrive in lowland uh, Europe. So 
Uh, this is an image. I really love this image. This image was taken on the side of a busy highway near Rotterdam. Um, and if you look in the top corner here where my, I'm circling, there's a white-tailed eagle nest next to a busy population centre, busy shipping lane. You know, this could be anywhere. This could be Portsmouth Harbour, this could be Poole Harbour, this could be Southampton Water, Chichester Harbour, you name it. It looks like southern England, doesn't it? And you look at what's in the Netherlands, the same bird species are there, the same, very same um, wintering assemblage of birds that are so important and the breeding birds are so important you know, here in southern England are in the Netherlands too. Uh, I don't need to list them, you guys will know them all really well. And you look at the diet of these birds in the Netherlands and uh, I have to say these numbers are slightly skewed because they're based on pellet remains and um, um, prey remains largely uh, and fish turn up really poorly in prey remains and white-tailed eagles, but the vast majority of their diet is made up of fish and water birds. And those water birds that it's made up are things that are really common in the Netherlands, things like grey lag geese, particularly goslings, um, but also coot. And everything likes to eat coot. As a, as a reserve warden I know, um, and he tells me, I, he, he tells me about what the birds, the birds of prey are eating and, uh, and herons and things are eating. And coot always gets mentioned. I mean, coot must just be really delicious. I don't know. Um, personally, I don't really want to find out. It sounds like something that probably doesn't taste very nice, but everything seems to enjoy eating coots. And there always seems to be more coots around the corner. I have no idea why. But also important from a project perspective is that there's no conflict with sheep or livestock farming in the Netherlands at all. And actually, when you look across Europe, there's no mention of, um, of conflict with livestock farming there either. So the only place that has ever been any conflict mentioned is actually in Scotland. So lowland Europe seems to be a really, really good place for these birds. And I'm gonna move swiftly on because time is rattling by. Um, and I'm gonna talk about reintroduction progress. And I think this is the bit that you all find most exciting. And, um, and I hope, um, hope this is the best bit for you guys. Firstly, I've got to mention that um, you know, this project is licensed by both Natural England and what was Scottish Natural Heritage, now Nature Scott. Natural England provide us a license to release the birds in England and Scottish, or Nature Scott now, sorry, provide us a license to collect birds from the wild in nests in Scotland um, of a proviso that we leave one bird behind. So we collect chicks roughly 10 weeks old, some, you know, slightly younger, probably between seven and a half weeks to 10 weeks old. Um, and at that age, they're old enough, they can look after themselves, really. They can feed themselves most critically, um, tear up their own food, um, and they don't need any human contact. So they stay as wild as possible. And that's really, really important, not only from a conflict perspective, but from reducing these birds' stress levels and, uh, and making sure they've got the best chance to survive in the wild in England. So we collect them from nests, uh, reel them in special pens here on the Isle of Wight, special aviaries, uh, and prior to being released, they're fitted with um, satellite tags, uh, checked by a vet, and off they go. Continue to provide food close to the release site throughout the year, actually, not just through the autumn and winter. Um, so the birds can always come back to feed with us if they feel they need to, and, uh, and there's a safe source of food there for them. Um, and we, the license actually allows us to release up to 60 birds over the, over the license period, which at the moment is, is five years. So that's 12 birds a year. We've released 25 to date. Um, and those of you that are good at maths will think 25 over three years, that's not 12 birds a year. Well, we're probably not going to get to 60 birds over, uh, over the five year period. So um, we'll see what happens uh, at the end of the five year time. So I mentioned uh, I've got to collect these birds from nests in Scotland. And I haven't got a head for heights. Um, I'm not a very tall person myself. I, uh, you know, I'm six foot in a heel, um, but you know, I'm not, um, I'm not very tall. So uh, getting any higher than, um, than five and a half feet is uh, pretty terrifying for me. Uh, but there's some really experienced climbers in, um, in Scotland um, and they're absolutely fantastic guys. You know, they're, they're really, um, you know, re really experienced, really, really skilled at what they do. And when they get to the top, they greet with this fantastic view. You know, look at that, uh, amazing. We've got two white-tailed eagles and a fantastic view of uh, the coast of Scotland. Who, who couldn't want to do that? And we collect one of these birds. We collect the oldest bird, the oldest, strongest bird that's going to be fit for translocation. Um, we leave the younger bird behind because um, that bird will actually thrive in the absence of its sibling 
Um, and white-tailed eagles are much, much better at looking after other white-tailed eagles than I am. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're giving um, the, the older bird, strongest bird, best chance we can, but the younger bird is not being neglected. Not all nests are in trees, as I mentioned earlier, so you get some really fantastic cliff nests, and you can see these, some of these images are from uh, the Outer Hebrides, and uh, you know, what, what incredible views and uh, incredible places they are. Um, but, you know, these guys have got to undertake some, some really serious uh, climbing and, uh, you know, kudos to them for their, for their efforts and uh, certainly something I, I couldn't do myself. Sorry, I'll just go turn my phone off, ringing. Um, and actually, rather funnily enough, their first flight is not um, uh, in the, off the nest themselves or out of the pens. It's in a, uh, in a little Cessna plane to the Isle of Wight. What an incredible, incredible story! They, they, I don't, I don't actually know how high those planes fly, but, um, but I, I find it quite funny that their first flight is a plane rather than with their wings. Uh, and they come to the Isle of Wight and they, they stay in this, uh, you know, relatively palatial uh, environment, I think. Uh, and green, I, green is always a, seems to be a bad choice for birds and for paintwork. Uh, they soon, they soon change the colour of the walls. Um, and we try and replicate a wild nest as best we can, so try and provide natural nest lining these perches for them to go out and branch out onto and learn how to you know strengthen their flight muscles and uh, and gradually get um ready for making their first flight in the wild so you can see from the image that that bird isn't quite fully developed even at um, nearly 10 weeks old it still hasn't quite got its uh, full complement of feathers uh, and it's still got a little bit uh, in terms of body size to grow but they're pretty much when they arrive with us full size in terms of body size um, and by the time they reach 12 weeks old, they're, they're pretty much there. So we hold them for roughly six to eight weeks. So we hold them a little longer than they would be held in the wild. You know, they, they would fledge in the wild before they fledge with us. By holding them a little bit longer, we know that they're fully competent at flying. They're not going to go and get stuck somewhere or, or run into trouble. Um, and not only do they get a palatial setting in terms of... Um, a view of the Solon and uh, and wonderful uh, housing, they always get this this uh, really incredibly luxurious diet whilst they're with us. So, all pretty much all the fish we get for them, then predominantly their diet is fish. With us, we do provide them with rabbit and occasionally uh, things like Canada geese and uh, pigeon and uh, and uh, whatever else we can get for them. But the vast majority of their diet is fish, and it's almost all of that comes from crab pots as bycatch around the Isle of Wight coast. So. Um, you can see in the top right hand photo there, uh, things like uh, cuckoo wrasse and ballon wrasse, but again, a, a lot of conger eel as well, and uh, um, conger eel seems to be a really big favourite of theirs. They, they really like their heads, and conger eels, for those of you that don't know, can get really, really big, and uh, they're quite a handful to chop up, and uh, in, the, in the first few weeks that they're with us, we try and give them sort of bite-sized pieces, so we chop them up into thumb sized pieces and uh, I've never wished to have bigger thumbs before but um, but chopping up kilo after kilo of fish and um, you know I've, I've, I've started to wish I had bigger hands and, uh, and bigger thumbs in particular so it can have bigger thumb sized pieces but um, in those particularly in those first few weeks we try and provide them with about a kilo of food each a day and it, yeah it's way way more than they need you know some people say oh, gosh a lot of food it's way more than they need in the wild um, but by providing that amount of food, they're held in, in uh, pens with roughly, you know, either two or three individuals. So there's not going to be any fighting over food and each bird is going to get more than enough food to survive um, and, and develop really well as well. As important, most importantly, not just survive, but develop really well. And a really neat thing these days is that technology has moved on a lot. So we can feed these birds without never seeing us. Um, so you've got a hole in the back of the wall there, um, just a really high tech bit of kit there. So you never even see me at all. They just see this garden trowel, plastic garden trowel coming through the wall, um, dropping chunks of fish uh, at their feet. But we can observe them on a really fantastic camera system and make sure that they're developing really well at that point. Cool. And just before they're released, they're fitted with these incredible um, transmitters. So these transmitters, you know, they're, they're smaller than a mobile phone, they only weigh 50 grams, um, but 
they're so so powerful i can't i can't express to you how powerful they are in, in words really other than to give you an example and that is you know they have a little mobile phone sim in them so they work on a gsm network um, and we can actually communicate with the devices so i can send a text message to an eagle which is pretty cool they never write back but you know i can send a text message to an eagle um, and we can actually get the device to change the transmission cycle we can get the device to change how frequently the um, uh, tag is, is um, collecting data. And we can even set up what we call geofences, so little grids on the map that tell us, uh, or give us more information or less information, whatever we want. So to be able to communicate with these devices is just so incredibly valuable and has enabled us to learn so much more about how these birds behave in the wild. Um, and after they're fitted with uh, these devices and the vet says, yep, they're fine there, we're happy for them to go, give them a, a little while to settle down. And then the uh, next few days, we start letting them out into the wild. And I always remember um, in the first year, Tim and Roy from the Roy Dennis Foundation said to me, um, you know, that was the easy bit when they were in the pens. Now the hard work begins. And uh, I was pretty knackered at that point and pretty tired um, uh, from chopping up all those thumb sized pieces of fish and uh, monitoring these birds on a day to day basis and constantly stressing about what might happen. I didn't really believe them at the time, but I can uh, assure you that um, it is much harder work when you don't know where they are every minute of the day, um, but much, much more rewarding. So, very briefly, um, you know, every, everything's brief for this talk because uh, 45 minutes is so much to fit into 45 minutes. What are some of the things we've discovered to date? You know, what, what have we learned? And I'm sure a lot of you would have seen a lot of maps like this. And the first thing we've learned is that they move a long, long way and they explore enormous distances. So, excuse me one second. So uh, these tracks, all these um, colored tracks are different birds all released last year in 2020. So these, there's movements and they're all up to date. So these are up to date movements of these birds. And you can see, um, and I hope some of you remember, I referenced um, how this project might help connect populations in expanding in Western Europe, Europe with those in the rest of the British Isles. And you can see a number of birds have gone to Northern Scotland and, uh, and to, into Southern Scotland. And also one bird remarkably has gone all the way through Northwest Europe. And all these birds would have seen other white-tailed eagles on their journeys, which is really remarkable. But most of them um, have returned to southern England. So remarkably, the other day, and some of you would have seen on Twitter um, or, or Instagram or, or wherever um, you know, it's been posted, and perhaps in some of your local media, one bird went to Western, um, Western Europe last spring, and only the other day, returned to England and he's actually somewhere in eastern England at the moment. I'm not going to go into any details about where birds are exactly um, because we try to keep that information relatively um, confidential um, not only for the welfare of the birds but also to try and um, reduce uh, pressure on um, on private landowners and, uh, and uh, sensitive sites from, a, from an ecology and biology perspective as well. But you can see these birds move enormous amounts of distances and uh, but after two or three years they start to return back to where they perceive to be home. But it doesn't mean to say that that bird in northern, right in northern Scotland, she may decide to stay up there. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Um, it does mean in the future we might, if we have a breeding population here on southern England, we might get some of those birds from the continent to stay with us here on the south coast. So, you know, that's great, isn't it? You know, these birds moving around, we can see on the map, we've got all that data, but data on a map is one thing. We need some hard field work to, uh, to back up some of that data and, and try and understand what that all means. And there's one bird that we know more about than any other, and that's this male, G274. He was released in 2019. He wasn't the first bird to be released, but I remember his first flight, he actually did get stuck in a willow coppice, which was a very, very frustrating situation. But he managed to free himself as uh, Tim and I went to rescue him. And ever since, he's never looked back. He's just gone from strength to strength. And, uh, and he's a bit of a pioneer 
and uh, and we'll see what happens in the coming years. But he's a he's a really exciting bird. And all his life, he's been on the south coast of England. He's never left the south coast of England, and the vast majority of it has actually been here on the Isle of Wight or with me on the Isle of Wight. So he's only been away from the Isle of Wight for probably about a month to, at best. His whole, you know, so he's made a few exploratory flights, one or two into the west of England, but a few more into um, into eastern England and and with you guys in uh, in, in uh, Sussex. And I'm, some of you would have seen this bird in Sussex, I'm sure. Um, you know, although he's not been there for a couple of years, um, you may have seen him in uh, the first lockdown. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you will remember that um, quite well. But the Isle of Wight is home for this bird, which means I can spend a lot of time going out and watching him and learning about what he's feeding on in particular. And, um, and what these birds feed on is probably the most um, sort of important question for mo a lot of stakeholders, not just um, us in conservation, but the farming community, the shooting community, um, you know, the tourism community. Everyone wants to know what these birds eat. And this is pretty up to date. We have more than I think it's something like 120, 130 observations of this bird feeding in the wild, which is pretty incredible. And uh, I've broken down for you um, for, for this bird's diet into sort of broad groups. So we've got bird, crustacean, fish, mammal, mollusk, and unidentified, which is it's basically can tell what it was from a long way away. So you can see that bird and fish, along with mollusk and crustacean make up most of this bird's diet. Um, and a lot of those unidentified things are probably fish um, that you're not really sure enough to make that judgment. And uh, a mollusk, for those of you are wondering what on earth, what mollusk are these birds eating, is cuttlefish. Um, so really, really remarkable. Um, and of the birds that these, um, this bird is taking, they're all things that are naturally abundant in the environment. So the, the two most common things that appear in this bird's diet are gulls and corvids. So they, they'll take this bird, these birds in the air, um, but they also take things like Canada geese on the water. And, um, and not only are the birds that he's, um, he's taking the most abundant in the environment, they're also almost always birds that are compromised in some way. They're either sick or they're, um, or they're injured or you know they're inexperienced or otherwise distracted. I remember uh, last spring this bird took a few coots and these are always coots that were fighting with other males for territory so they were otherwise you know a bit beaten up and um, perhaps uh, a bit distracted by, uh, by hormones and things but um, this bird took the opportunity to take these birds at that time um, and then um, crustaceans this is uh, these are foraging for crabs on the shoreline and the fish that this bird takes, it you know, can take fish in any kind of water. Um, and remarkably, this bird will even go five kilometers off the coast of the Isle of Wight to catch fish, which is absolutely staggering. Um, something we didn't really expect. And something else we didn't expect about this bird taking fish is that it takes fish year round. This isn't a bird that just takes fish when these um, animals are most abundant during the spring and summer months. This bird takes fish year round. And when it's available, it is highly preferred. So on good days, like days like we had today, no doubt, I haven't looked at the data today, but no doubt this bird would have been somewhere where fish were available. Um, and um, the mammals that this bird takes, you know, of that 20% um, chunk layer of the pie, uh, in terms of mammals, it's, I think it's something like 80% of this bird's diet is um, uh, rabbits and hares most of it being rabbits. The other things that make up um, its diet have been carrion items or items that have been stolen from other birds. We've actually got um, this bird eating a water vole that is stolen from marsh harrier, which is uh, pretty staggering, and, but also things like brown rats that they steal off harriers. Um, uh, and then it will eat, eat larger carcasses like uh, you know, dead, dead badgers and foxes, things like that. But not only is this diet We've got a really good idea of what this bird's eating and, uh, you know, if you were on the Isle of Wight today, I could take you out and we could probably find him and we'd have a good chance of seeing him being really active in the landscape and that's really exciting. But I think what's really, really exciting from our perspective is that in, uh, in the coming years, we anticipate that this bird may be the first, well, it has formed a pair 
with a bird on the left. So the bird on the right is G274, bird on the left is G324, who's had a remarkable journey of her own. Um, spent her first summer up all the way up uh, in the Lammermere Hills in southern Scotland, came back last September and has never left the island since. It's been paired with this male and they are seen together almost on a daily basis. They have very much formed the first pair in southern England for some 250 years. And we hope that they will be the first breeding, successful breeding birds in England um, in the next year or so, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And, and hopefully we'll be able to share with you guys um, you know, some more information and, uh, and people might be able to see them. Um, we'll hopefully be able to have a public site that people can view them in the coming years. But I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking, well, you know, that's great. You know, really great to hear about the Isle of Wight and hear about first breeding birds there and uh, or first potential breeding birds there and, uh, and hear about all their amazing journeys. And you can see some of those amazing journeys on the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation website um, and see some of the maps that we share. But what about Sussex? What's going on in Sussex? Um, why haven't you talked about Sussex in more detail? And it's very difficult for us to talk in a lot of detail about birds. Um, and where they are and what they're doing, um, you know, it's, it's hard for me to get to Sussex and observe these birds. And uh, and and um, I'm sure some of you that are listening have, um, have been providing us really helpful uh, sightings and any sort of diet sightings uh, or any feeding sightings are really really valuable for helping us understand how these birds live in the landscape. And I'm sure many of you have seen this bird in particular, G408, um, who has been living in uh, in Sussex. Uh, on and off for most of the last um, sort of seven months. Um, he spent all of his first winter on the Isle of Wight um, and many of you would have seen him at Polborough Brooks, uh, the RSPB site in the Arran Valley. What an incredible place that is and, uh, and no doubt that will be an eagle territory for years to come um, and who knows maybe maybe you guys will have a breeding pair of eagles in the Arran Valley before we have one here on the Isle of Wight. Um, but there are plenty of other good areas for white-tailed eagles in Sussex, not just the Arran Valley. And uh, um, we've had a number of birds visit not only the Arran Valley, but the, uh, the South Downs in particular seems to be a nice stop off, stop -off point for white-tailed eagles. Um, and, and no doubt in the, in the coming spring, having just released 12 white-tailed eagles here on the Isle of Wight this summer, no doubt some of these juveniles will visit you in the spring and who knows, maybe some of them Will establish territories on the Sussex coast in the in the years to come. Now I think that will wrap up nicely for some questions and uh, I finished on this slide. Um, people always ask what's going on in this photo, it's just a uh, just a really funny photo. Um, doesn't, it, it, there's no um, deliberate act there on the part of a white-tailed eagle, um, but perspective is, is everything isn't it? And uh, thank you for listening and uh, hopefully you all found that very interesting. Thanks very much, Steve. If you uh, unshare your screen, uh, I think we'll go straight into the Q&A because there are an awful lot of very good questions and we're not going to have time, I don't think, to go through all of them. But uh, let's crack on and uh, ask Martin to come in and ask maybe five or six and just see how much time we've got after that. So over to you, Martin. OK, thank you, Mark. Uh, Stephen. One of the things that was uh, interesting for several people was how white-tailed eagles interact with um, golden eagles um, in Scotland. Are That's a good question. Um, was there anything else to that question? Sorry, Martin. Just that. Uh, just okay. that. Are there any conflicts? Uh, no, not really. So um, uh, in terms of uh, white-tailed eagles and golden eagles, white-tailed eagles are very, very slightly bigger. But generally speaking, golden eagles are dominant at carcasses. Um, and, um, you know, are, are, are much more um, formidable predators in a lot of ways. Um, White-tailed eagles almost a bit more vulture-like in, uh, in their behaviour in Scotland. But the two live alongside one another really well in Scotland, and you can go to places, particularly on the, on the outer Hebrides and, um, and even on the inner Hebrides, um, where there are white-tailed eagle nests and golden eagle nests almost within a kilometre of one another. And there's not, there's not, they don't have any written agreement or anything, but yeah. but almost go in separate directions and avoid conflict where they can. Okay, um, there was also interest in the, um, in the uh, radio devices. 
Um, somebody was saying that uh, they can use even tinier radio devices on small birds. And, uh, can they be used instead of the larger ones? Well, the great advantage of using a larger device. So, I mean, there's quite strict regulations on what you can put on a bird. So, um, you know, this, this makes up less than 4% of this bird's body weight. Um, so it's a very light device. But the larger device you have, a greater sort of computing power you have from that device. So, I mean, it is, these devices are tiny. They are tiny. And, and many of you that have seen birds released by a project probably would have seen these devices on the back of a bird. But the bigger device you have, the bigger the battery, the more um, sort of sensor data you can collect, um, the more regularly you can collect GPS points, and the better understanding you can develop of how these birds are living in the landscape. Um, and another interesting point was uh, your data on, on diet. Um, how do you collect that data? Does it come from observations or, um, or pellets or, or both? So, um, so and that's a really good point. And um, uh, so the, the um, pie chart I shared earlier, that is purely from observations. That okay. pie chart. Uh, we do collect data from pellets. So I will visit um, where appropriate and uh, with landowner consent, I will visit some roost areas and, um, and try and collect pellets. Pellets are actually pretty hard to come by. Um, what to tell Once these birds develop a regular roost, you often find that um, foxes and badgers come and scavenge the remains quite quickly. And um, um, the, I suppose the overwhelming um, prey item that turns up in pellets is rabbit fur. It seems to be the thing that the badgers and the foxes don't want to eat. Um, and so you just find lots of rabbit fur, generally speaking. Um, but we are hoping to do a study with a university looking at DNA samples of, um, of, uh, of, of pellet remains and see if we can identify not only what species are, I mean, we can uh, get, get a good idea from uh, looking through the remains of what they are, but you know, DNA barcoding these days, you can you know, pretty much be sure of what it is, but also we might be able to find out how many individuals are found in those pellets and even which eagle has uh, coughed up that pellet because we have the DNA sequences for all the birds that we release, or we will have the DNA sequences for all the birds that we released through the project. Okay, thank you. I think possibly only time for one more question. Um, one of the things that interested people was the, the eagle names from, I think, was it ancient Anglo-Saxon names or, or something like that? Yes. Um, how do you know that they referred to just white-tailed eagles and perhaps not any other eagles such perhaps uh, as golden eagles? That's a really good question and I have to be honest, I don't, I don't know the answer to that and I, I suspect um, uh, we, we do know that Anglo-Saxons did differentiate between white-tailed eagle and golden eagle, um, but in terms of place names, I couldn't tell you for certain um, oh. how how it happens. There is um, there is some really good text available for those that are interested, um, and I. Should... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's bang on eight o'clock. I don't know if Mark, you want to carry on any further, or um, or hey, address the other just question. Just ask um, yeah. one more, I think, and then then we'll have to answer the rest on the website later. Okay. Um, the first question I had actually was, were there any plans to go ahead with the uh, Norfolk project? Uh, so I'm, I'm not involved with Norfolk project personally, yeah. um, but the license is a 10 year license. Uh, and I'm sure many of you will have read the news that um, the project won't go ahead at Wildken Hill. But um, as I understand, you know, Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation are really keen to find another partner in, uh, in Norfolk and, and hopefully um, find means of proceeding with project, but um, but I say I'm, I'm not directly involved with that project. Okay. Okay, thanks. Look, guys, um, there are so many really good questions that we haven't been able to answer. So um, I'm going to send them in an email to Steve and he'll hopefully answer them and we'll post them on our website. So apologies if you haven't been able to um, have your question answered. Just um, finally, before I say my thanks, um, do think about joining the Sussex Ornithological Society. You can get um, three bird reports, the current one and ones for the last two years, all for the price of one. Um, so, Steve, that was actually the best attended talk we've ever had. And, um, and, and nobody dropped out. That was absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much indeed. I know you haven't been 100 percent the last couple of days. So particular thanks for, for such a, 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 an eloquent 
informative and um, laced with wit talk. Thank you very much indeed. I must re take that recording, I think, Mark, and share it with people. <laughs> <laughs> but no, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk okay. to you. Uh, and good luck with the project. And thanks to everybody who joined. Um, and uh, we'll see you at another talk, hopefully, uh, over the winter. Bye-bye, everyone.